Hello and welcome to the Sakori Sit Down. I'm your host, Justin Channel, and this is a monthly podcast about website security where we get in depth with the malware removal experts here at Sakori. Later in the show, I'll have our analyst Krasimir Konov on to chat about some different types of malware. But first, let's take a look at other topics we published on our blog and Sakori Labs notes this month. First up, we have some new information about credit card skimming with hackers using a hybrid method to steal payment information from e-commerce websites. Our analyst Dennis Sinagubko wrote about this for the Sakori blog back at the beginning of June. Now, most credit card stealing malware is a client-side JavaScript that grabs data and sends it to a third-party server. But that approach has a drawback for bad actors because it's still possible to track the requests and catch them as being suspicious. Now, to get around that, bad actors have started harvesting information server-side by modifying core PHP files. In this case, the infection would be undetectable from the outside, but it's still going to be pretty easy to find because you're rarely modifying any of those core files, so any of those changes that are going to come up are going to be suspicious. So to get around both of these drawbacks, we're seeing bad actors combine the two. So client-side snippets of JavaScript are sending stolen credit card data to server-side scripts that they've installed on the same server as the site. Now, this allows bad actors to cover their tracks a little bit because the traffic that's being redirected is going to the same server, and that's less likely to be flagged as suspicious. It's a bit more complicated to pull this off, but our team has been seeing this hybrid approach in the wild, so it's something to be on the lookout for. Now, another month has passed and we've found more cross-site scripting attacks targeting WordPress plugins. Most notably, we discovered one that affects users of the Yith WooCommerce Ajax product filter plugin. Now, this is a plugin that allows WooCommerce stores to be filtered by product type, and it's pretty popular. It's got about 100,000 users right now, so with it being vulnerable, it's very important that all of them update to the latest version, which is 3.11.1. Uh, some of the other plugins we found cross-site scripting vulnerabilities with included Elementor Page Builder, CareerFi, Job Search, and Newspaper. If you're looking for a full list of vulnerabilities that have been patched this month, John Castro at the Sequoia Labs blog has you covered. Check out our show notes for a link. Also, this month I had a blog go up detailing what's called a gibberish hack. It's basically the same motivation as an SEO spam attack where bad actors use your site's good standing to redirect visitors to their own sites. But in this attack, you'll find a bunch of randomly named folders filled with a ton of HTML files with really nonsensical file names like cheap cool hairstyles photos.html. It's just going to be a mishmash of keywords that clearly you didn't put there. Unfortunately, just deleting all those HTML files and folders is not going to be enough to get rid of that gibberish hack though. You're going to need to fully clean any hacked files and database tables. And then you're going to have to deal with all the damage caused to your site's standing. And just keep in mind, if you find anything about that process too daunting, we're always here to help. Now for this month's sit down, we have Sikori analyst Krasimir Konov. Earlier in June, he had written a labs note about a malicious downloader script that used the curl function, and we chatted a bit about it, but more importantly, we went really in depth on all the different varieties of malware that website owners need to be aware of. But before I get started with Krasimir, I just wanted to remind you about the Sikori Sync Up, our sister podcast. It's a weekly website security news briefing that you can find anywhere you get your podcasts, as well as a video version on our social media feed, and now you can even get it on your Amazon Alexa smart speakers. Just search Amazon Skills for Sikori sync up, add the flash briefing, and get new content delivered every Monday. Now, on with the show. Hi, Krasimir. Uh, thanks for joining us on the show. I thought we could start off and maybe have you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at Sakuri. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I joined Sakuri originally in 2014, but um, I've been in the IT business for about 10 years. Nine of those I did security. Um, and currently at Sakuri, I'm one of the malware analysts. I used to work in the front lines, used to clean websites and whatnot, and then i um, I gradually moved up, and now I'm working as uh, in the malware research department. And my day-to-day -day job is basically um, analyzing malware. And then um, once I analyze it and figure out what it is, then I will create a signature for it, and uh, we would add those signatures to our tools so we can automate some of the work we do. And um, I also write some labs notes, blog posts, you know, 
usually if I find something interesting in malware or some um, some security topic, yeah, I'll write about it. Yeah, and, and uh, of those topics recently that you wrote about, uh, one was about a uh, malicious curl downloader. And uh, how exactly did that work? Right, yeah, that, that was an interesting one, but uh, not very... Um, you know, unique or anything like that. We, we see that a lot with curl being used as a downloader. Um, it's a very common malware. Um, so the malware, rather than including the actual malware in the file, the attackers would use curl to download the malicious code. Uh, in this case, they'll download it from pastebin, but it could be anything, it could be another website or anything like that. And um, curl would just make a call to the website, um, request the code, the website will respond with the code, and then later on there is some, uh, some code to either save um, the output somewhere on the website or it'll just uh, run it through eval and execute the actual code right away. Right. And um, now you said that it is, it's commonly found in malware, but um, let's kind of maybe talk a bit broader about malware in general. Like what are, what is everything that is classified as malware? Well, uh, in general, it will be anything that uh, the owner of the website didn't authorize, um, you know, anything that was added by a third party, um, uh, there is a, a lot of different malware. It could be even like something like a defacement that will also be considered malware because it was something the user didn't authorize, even if, even though it might not be doing anything malicious on the website, like it's not infecting users to visit. It's still something they didn't authorize, so a defacement would also be considered malware. And even something like ransomware, where the, the website is technically not really damaged, it's all encrypted, but it's not infecting anybody. It's not doing anything malicious. Um, but it's, uh, it's still encrypting the entire website and asking the user or the customer or the owner of the website for a ransom they need to pay in order to get the website back online. Okay, let's maybe like break it down to like each individual type of malware. Like, um, for example, what would be a way that maybe iframes could be maliciously used by a hacker? Yeah, um, uh, the, an iframe can be used maliciously when it loads content from another location. Um, like you can look at the iframe as like a window that just opens another website. So anything that website has on it, uh, you're pretty much loading it through the iframe. So if the website is infected and it's serving some kind of malware by opening an iframe, uh, you're loading all those elements, everything that was on this website. And sometimes uh, the, the iframe can be as small as like a pixel or something hidden somewhere off the screen. So you wouldn't even know that it was opening it. And yeah, and I, I feel like we've, we've also seen a lot of them where, where they're used almost to like uh, mimic like pop-ups as well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, the iframe, it could um, it could just load from another website and the other website could do anything. It could be serving just malware and it would try to infect the user that doesn't even know that they're being connected to the other website. Um, they could just have some other JavaScript that's just trying to open a pop-up uh, on the original website through the iframe. Yeah, it could be a lot of things. Okay, and... Um... Also, I, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, conditional redirects and how those work. Like, what allows a script to detect which devices are coming and 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 where they're coming from? Right. Yeah, that, that's a common one we see a lot. Um, basically, a conditional redirect would be something. Uh, it's a, it's a redirect on the website. It's obviously malicious, but there are certain conditions that need to be met before the redirect is actually uh, executed or the redirect happens. For example, um, let's say if it's on a phishing website or a phishing page that uh, is hidden somewhere on the website. Like, uh, for example, if Google visits it, obviously the attacker doesn't want Google to see the actual phishing page and record it as a phishing page. So they would look for, for example, the IP address. They would look for like the user agent. And a lot of times they can tell that it's a bot. Um, so they would uh, just return like a 404 response. For example, it would be like, oh, page not found. So Google would be like, oh, um, looks like this page doesn't exist. But then if a regular user goes to the same page, then those conditions will be met like the... Um, the actual website or the script behind the phishing will check and see and be like, oh, this one is, uh, you know, running a Firefox or Chrome. You'd be like, okay. And then they'll look at the IP and be like, oh, he's in whatever. He's in the United States somewhere. He's like, oh, okay, that's good. And then once all these conditions are met, then the actual script will serve him the actual phishing page. And it'll be like, oh, you need to fill out this to recover your, you know, account or whatever, or type in your credentials to log in here. 
Mm -hmm. And so like, like this is the type of thing where really uh, like a website owner is going to run into this, like more commonly, like when people are complaining about, you know, they're getting served, you know, bad content or whatever, and they can't seem to replicate it. It's likely probably these, these kind of redirects. Is that right? Right, right. It could be something as specific as, as for example, uh, a range of IP addresses that correspond to like an ISP or maybe like, a, like say, let's say a country. It could be like, oh, we're targeting only customers in the US. So if you're connecting from like another country and you go to the same website or the same page, it will just say 404, it will give you page not found. But then if you actually have a IP address from the United States, you're connecting from the United States, then it will actually show you the phishing page. Mm -hmm. Now, another uh, type of malware I feel like we, we see a lot here is uh, SEO spam. We hear people talking about that. Um, what are some of like the top SEO spam keywords that you see coming through? Yeah, uh, we, we get that a lot. We see uh, a lot of spam on websites. Um, a lot of times attackers will use SEO spam to gain ranking for their own website or they'll just try to include some kind of SEO spam and links to a, a, another website that they're um, currently running or something. I mean, these things change all the time. So a website might be up for a week and then it'll disappear and then they'll start another campaign. Um, but uh, yeah, we see that a lot. We see all kinds of keywords they use. Uh, most common ones will be something like Viagra. We'll have like uh, jerseys for sale. Um, a lot of times we'll, they'll use name brands like Nike, Rolex, Prada. Um, we've seen some, even some essay writing services for some reason. I'm not sure why, but uh, that's common. We see, for example, pharmaceuticals a lot. Like uh, they'll use specific um, medicine names. Um, uh, they'll use all kinds of replicas, like a replica bag of this, replica this, a replica that. Um, we see prescription, uh, also payday loans, and obviously there's like some uh, adult-related sites and things like that, keywords. So pretty much anything that people are going to be searching and clicking on are probably going to be targets for SEO spam? Right. I think a lot of it uh, is commonly is pharma related because a lot of people are looking to buy medicine online and a lot of times it will require a prescription. So a lot of people are like, oh, let me see if I can find this medicine that somebody I can buy it online somewhere. That they don't need a prescription. You know, they don't want to pay to, to go visit a doctor and whatnot and they'll look for it. And uh, yeah. And now, whenever somebody's website does get uh, hacked with an SEO spam attack, what kind of effect can it have on the website beyond just, you know, being defaced? Yeah, it can have a lot of, um, a lot of, um, a lot of things can happen, um, negative things. Like, for example, the website can be blacklisted um, because of the keywords. Um, and uh, that usually represents uh, a big red warning when you go on the website depending on who blacklisted it um, but if it's google for example you'll see a big warning and it'll tell you oh this website contains malware or, you know uh, there's something wrong with this website so pretty much all the traffic on the website will be gone and then uh, you can also uh, lose a lot of your reputation if uh, there is uh, seo spam on the website uh, for example if uh, uh, if you were ranked in, like, say, number five for certain keywords that represent your product on Google search engines, and then suddenly you got hit with SEO spam, then uh, all these search engines then go and visit the website, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, there's like all these weird keywords on here, you know, all this SEO spam that's uh, causing uh, a lot of mixed signals, and uh, the search engines are like, oh, where do we rank this website now? Do we rank them with, like, these, this product that's originally what the website is about, or do we take into consideration all these like other keywords that are mixed up their SEO spam. So all of a sudden your website might go from like being ranked number five on the first page to like being on the 10th page. And then you rank for all these other um, keywords that you didn't intend to. And then people search for, you know, for something completely different, like they're searching for jerseys or something, or, you know, they're searching for product products, and then suddenly your website pops up in there. So you're not really getting any good traffic, you know, not targeted traffic. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, hey, so in a lot of ways, um, you know, the, and the effects of SEO spam would kind of be the same for, for defacements or any kind of malware with the blacklisting, but it does bring that kind of like unique part to it where, 
then it could also then bring traffic that you weren't expecting from like you know, somebody searching for jerseys, for example. I, I had not really ever, ever thought about that. Right, right. Yeah, it will, it will definitely bring some traffic. I've seen a lot of times uh, where websites will be connected. Like, let's say, like there was like a thousand websites that were all infected with SEO spam, and they would kind of link to each other uh, to try to like bring each other up into the rankings. And so you would see a lot of uh, strange traffic from like some random websites that were, uh, for example, they were previously infected, even if they, they might not be anymore. But yeah, they'll, uh, they'll be sending traffic to you or they'll be. Um, usually search engines sending you traffic but for the wrong keywords you know people are looking for something else so obviously they're not gonna be interested in your website they're not gonna buy anything because they were not looking for that mm -hmm. and now uh so thinking of, of of the way websites get infected a, a very common way it seems to be is, is through phishing campaigns do you know what are some recommendations you have for the best ways to avoid becoming a phishing victim um, yeah, uh, there is some ways. I mean, it depends really on the type of attack. Uh, obviously, a lot of people, when they think of phishing, they think, oh, it's just like, you know, it's just like a PayPal phishing page and it just looks like the original, but it could be more subtle. Um, if it's a if it's just like a regular page where you're just going and you get redirected to another website, um, Obviously, the first thing to look is uh, if you have the security padlocks, make sure the traffic is encrypted. Um, a lot of these websites don't really have um, any encryption. Uh, nowadays, more starting to get that uh, with uh, free SSLs being issued and whatnot. But uh, that's the first thing to look and see. Make sure, you know, anywhere you're typing your sensitive information, you want to make sure you have the padlock to make sure everything is encrypted. But also, you want to look at the URL of the actual website you're visiting, you know. Um, a lot of times they'll try to hide it, so you might have to be careful and look closely. Uh, you know, something that might be an I uh, will be an L or something like that. And if uh, like a capital I and an L might look kind of similar in the URL, so you might miss something like that. Like say, if you're looking for PayPal and they might replace the L with an I. And if you don't look closely, it might look exactly the same. And you're like, oh, okay, it's paypal.com, but not really. Um, so yeah, just pay attention to the URL. Make sure it is the actual website. There's no like, uh, you know, um, paypal.com dot something dot something else. You know, dot com. Uh, yeah, you want it to just say paypal.com and then it'll have forward slash and uh, something else. Um, but yeah, it, it gets uh, more complicated when you have like, for example, a phishing page that's injected into like a, a regular page. Like for example. Um, you have a checkout page on a website that uh, you're buying things from and you go to the checkout page and you're looking at the, you know, where you type in your, your credit card information and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And you might have a phishing page that actually looks exactly like a little box that gives you like where you put, uh, you, put you put in your credit card number, your name, your address and all that. Um, so that one will be more subtle. For example, that could be also an iframe that's just coming mm -hmm. from another page and it'll yeah. look exactly, uh, exactly like, uh, you know, like it's part of the website, you know, you're on the legitimate website, but only that portion of the website is actually the phishing page. And you, you look at it and you're like, Oh, okay. It looks like it looks fine. You know, I'll just put in my credentials. Uh, so that one could be a lot harder to, figure it out usually if it's something like that i look for something uh something that looks kind of out of place maybe they didn't get the right font you know it might not be the same as the original website or there might be something out of place uh you know some fields that are missing or some fields that are like uh, squished into the left or the right you know that's like it looks kind of kind of awkward it's like why would this be like this you know the whole website looks professional there's like a pink background or something for example and then suddenly there's like this white box in the middle it's like ah that looks kind of weird like mm -hmm. out of place so pretty much if anything looks slightly out of place, like you really should, you know, double check everything at that point. Right, right. Yeah, obviously there's more ways that you can check, but I wouldn't get into more technical, like <laughs> inspecting elements and looking at stuff, but yeah. yeah. And now um, another another type of malware that that's kind of it, and it kind of plays in with whatever the other infection is is backdoors. Um, can you give us some examples of what those what backdoors can be? It's it's mainly just when a when a hacker reinfects this can can get back into the site to reinfect it. But I uh, I know there are like a ton of different methods and, and what are some of the more common ones and then maybe some that are really interesting that you've seen. 
Uh, yeah, there is a lot. Like, uh, they'll probably be one of the first things a hacker would do is if they compromise a website, obviously they'll try to spread backdoors and, you know, just inject um, code everywhere so they can get back in. Even if the owner of the website, a webmaster, cleans it, they want to try and hide some malicious code somewhere so they can always get back in. Um, there's many, many variations. Uh, a backdoor, backdoor could be something as, uh, as simple as a single line of code that just... Uh, takes an argument, um, you know, some kind of string or something via either via get or post, and then it runs into an eval, so it evaluates the code and executes it. Um, and some there's, some backdoors are very complex, uh, and they can uh, they can be included um, in um, let's say you have a WordPress site and you have a specific login page where all the login credentials are being processed and everything else. Um, they can even inject code into that to basically bypass the whole um, login mechanism so that they can just bypass everything. They don't even have to know any user. They don't have to know the password, nothing. They'll just include some lines in there. And every time they'll be just able to log in. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's uh, all kinds of malware. Um, you know, there is always uh, malware that, for example, just targets credit cards and will just... Uh, you know, target the, the e-commerce websites, and they'll just try to steal uh, the login credential. I mean, the the credit cards. Uh, they'll try to get all the like the, your address, your credit card information, like your um, any kind of CVV code or whatever you typed into the the, the billing address, everything. Uh, and then there's also malware like the backdoors that are just trying to keep the the attacker, uh, you know, in control and trying to get him back into the the website. Um, uh, there is also um, uh, there. There's just so many variations of like what a malicious user might want to do on a website. Some can be something as simple as just like um, reinfecting the website. Like they don't want to keep control; they just want to keep reinfecting it with some kind of malware. So even if you clean it, it will just get reinfected. You know, some of them in the database; otherwise, it might be in the files. Uh, we've seen some added into a Chrome job that just keeps running on the server. Um, there could be malware that's just uh, trying to, for example, attack other websites, like, for example, a, a distributed denial of service where they put the same malware on like thousands of websites and then they try to send traffic to one website, try to bring it down. Uh, yeah, there's, um, you know, people try to do all kinds of stuff with websites. We've seen like even some... Uh, cryptocurrency mining malware that you go on the website and suddenly your your PC starts running like crazy and you're like, what the hell is going on? You know, like your pants turn on and the PC is like 100% CPU and it turns out that the website has some malware that's just buy, mining Bitcoins with your CPU and it's using all of it, so. Wow. <laughs> okay, so um, one question now, the last question I have is, uh, of all the malware that you've seen, what do you think is the coolest piece of malware that you've ever seen? I think the coolest will be the ones that are so subtle that you don't even know that it's there. Uh, for example, we've seen some that were pretty innovative. Like it will be just like um, a one-liner code. There's just one line. And for example, it will be like, um, let's say, 40, 50 characters, something like that. And that's all it is. And they'll hide it somewhere in between the legitimate code. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you would never see it. You know, it doesn't look... Um, you know, suspicious. There is no like links to some other website. There is no like uh, some kind of encrypted code or anything like that. It's just a simple one line. And then if you're just scrolling through the file looking for something, you would never see it. It just just looks like all the other code. And then if you look closely, you're like, oh, you know, there's like this. Uh, you know, you look closely and you're like, oh, wow, this is not supposed to be there. You know, and then you keep looking at it and you're like, this looks really weird. And then you you see that it's actually doing some malicious things and, you know, trying to evaluate some code or is taking output from the outside, you know, I mean, some input from outside, you can uh, call it and uh, give it code to run. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Krasimir, thanks for coming on and, uh, and talking to us for today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy. I'm, uh, uh, I'm glad I was able to do this podcast and uh, I can't wait to do another one. Yeah, well, I'll be on again. Thanks. Uh -huh, thank you.
Thanks again to Krasimir for joining us here on the Sikori Sit Down. We'll be back with another episode next month, so be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or any podcasting platform. Also, be sure to follow us on social media at Sikori Security and check us out at Sikori.net. That's S-U-C-U-R-I dot net. I'm Justin Channel, and this has been the Sikori Sit Down. Stay safe out there. Thank you.